I'm Indy Nidell. And I'm James Tiberius Kirk. And I'm Captain Pike, the captain before Kirk, and this is Sabaton History. The Battle of Monte Cassino was a series of Allied assaults in Italy during the Second World War. And our song Union is about that battle. Regard your soldiers as your children, and they will follow you into the deepest valleys. Look upon them as your own beloved sons, and they will stand by you even unto death. The Italo-German forces had suffered defeat after defeat, had been pushed out of North Africa, and by August 1943 had lost their grip on Sicily as well. With Mussolini removed from power, not only an end to the Italian commitment to the Axis powers, but an invasion of the Italian mainland by the Allies seemed imminent. German General Feldmarschall Albert Kesselring, supreme commander of the German forces in the Mediterranean theater, planned for a series of fortification lines south of Rome that would delay the Allies until his main defenses, the Bernhardt and Gustav lines in central Italy, were ready. There, with the huge mass of Monte Cassino in its center, they would make their stand along the steep ridges, mountain peaks, and rivers. The Italian theater would not be the place to decide the war. But for the Allied generals, it would tie down as many German forces as possible, preventing them from going to other theaters where they were badly needed. So, a series of grim battles against the German fortifications awaited the Allied forces on their march northwards. Italy is tough country to fight in. 80% of it is pretty rugged terrain with, with rocky hills and high mountain ranges and only corridors through the valleys of thick forests and deep marshes. Most travel routes run from east to west, not north to south, which limited the few options the Allies had in their approach. Leapfrogging towards their defenses around Monte Cassino, the Germans used the terrain as a useful multiplier of their forces. Observation posts and mortar pits were blasted into the mountainsides. Pillboxes and concrete bunkers were well, we're all over, and the settlements around were prepared with anti-tank ditches, hidden machine gun posts, belts of barbed wire, minefields, and flooded fields. It was truly a fortress, one of the most formidable defense systems, not just in this war, but in military history as a whole, with a network in depth of mutually supporting nests of resistance all along the mountain peaks. And above it all, towered the old Benedictine monastery and abbey, looking down on the ever-advancing Allied forces. In early 1944, after a series of bloody battles failed to break through, the task of attacking from the Adriatic Front was given to Lieutenant General Freiburg, commander of the New Zealand and 4th Indian Divisions. Freiburg was a living legend. He had won the Victoria Cross during the Great War, had fought at Gallipoli, the Somme, and in this war was a veteran of Crete and El Alamein. Now, he was tasked by British Prime Minister Winston Churchill himself with keeping Kesselring from Anzio, where Allied landings would soon hopefully build a beachhead. It was American General Mark Clark, though, who wanted the breakthrough on that front before the landings at Normandy and France could happen. For that, a costly frontal attack seemed the only option. It all reminded Freiburg of the Somme back in 1917. The, the terrible sight of bloated corpses from many nations lying in the churned up ground for months as heavy rain turned the whole area into a thick morass. Small advances were paid for with blood, running up against machine guns and barbed wire. On the high ground, sleet and snow caused epidemic frostbite and froze the oil in the engines. On the lower ground, where nothing thrived in the mud and rain but mosquitoes, there was little shelter except caves and trenches. Trucks could not advance, and it took six hours for mules to get the wounded down from the heights. Shell-shocked, deprived of sleep, in rain and snow, the men endured like zombies. Discipline and morale eroded to the point where officers had to patrol the rear to intercept men trying to slip away to nearby Italian villages. Venereal diseases, too, caused as many casualties as the German booby traps and mines. 
The Germans fared little better, though. Under constant barrages of artillery, they lay in, in wet holes in the ground and covered themselves with the same wet blankets day after day after day. In mid-January 1944, the first battle for Casino was fought to a standstill, and men from many different nations faced the appalling and merciless conditions of the harsh Italian winter. Alongside British and American forces fought the French Expeditionary Force, made up of Moroccans, Algerians, and Tunisians, the Japanese Americans from the 100th Nisei, Polish troops, Indians, including Punjabis and Gurkhas, and thousands of Italian volunteers. They were facing not only the Germans, but volunteers and conscripts native to Poland, Czechoslovakia, the Baltics, and the Soviet Union. While the French fought a costly battle through the mountains in the east, the British attempted to cross the major streams Garigliano and Rapido, trying to link up with the Anzio beachhead and outflank the whole German system from the left. With clear air and artillery superiority, they hoped to simply force their way through the Gustav Line and into the Leary Valley. P-40 Kitty Hawks and A-20 bombers provided a constant curtain of air support, but the German defenses held. They were quicker at deploying operational reserves and plugging holes in the lines. The German Luftwaffe's 1st Fallschirmjäger Division, one of the most formidable units in the Italian theater, manned independent resistance nests everywhere. Alongside them stood Gebirgsjäger and mobile Panzergrenadier divisions, experienced in small battle group fighting and commanded by officers with years of Eastern Front experience. And German observers hidden on the monastery hill saw everything that approached them. The ancient abbey of Casino had defied attacks from the south for centuries, and now the Benedictine monastery with its 100-foot high walls of quarried limestone up to 30 feet thick was a symbol of defiance, staring down on the miserable attackers. With its underground crypts, old chapels and basilicas, priceless artwork and libraries, it was a sacred place for Christendom worldwide, even housing the relics of St. Benedict himself. But as thousands died at its feet, it became also a malevolent place. In the eyes of many allied soldiers, the monastery mocked and taunted them with its grandeur, always on the horizon, always out of reach. At first, it was excluded from the list of bombing targets. Though the Germans had carried away much of the art and relics before the battle began, storing most of it in monasteries and salt mines all over Italy and Germany. Some, of course, found itself a new home in Hermann Goering's eccentric living room. By February, the voices to destroy it became louder. Capturing it intact seemed to be suicide. By mid-February, its fate was decided, and on the 14th, Leaflets were dropped warning the inhabitants in the whole region of the imminent destruction of the abbey. The next day, waves of B-17 flying fortresses and B-26 bombers came out of the heavens and turned it into a burning ruin. An outcry came from the whole Catholic world, and to this day, it is still debated whether the monastery was of military value. The monks at the time insisted that the Germans had declared it a safe zone, and no military forces were inside. And it is possible that during the Allied decoding of German messages, they confused the word Abt, German for Abbot, with Abteilung, the German word for detachment. But whatever it had been a day earlier, now the Germans were quick to incorporate the ruins into their defense system. Progress was snail-like for the attackers. The New Zealanders and Indians began the fight for Casino Town and every house was carefully sandbagged and turned into a bunker. German snipers were relentless though, and paratroopers fought for every corner. Independent nests of resistance preyed on advancing allies with automatic weapons and hand grenades. Even a few panzers and assault guns had survived hidden in the cellars. Street fights were fought over streets that basically no longer existed by men who brought bazookas to a gunfight. On the Ides of March, a second bombardment was to smash the German positions. A thousand guns, among them three giant Italian railway guns, left 
nothing surrounding Casino unscathed, smothering the German positions in fire and explosions. However, as if awakened by the destruction, Mount Vesuvius erupted two days later, belching smoke and ash into the air and sending lava flooding down its slopes. By April, it was clear that the Germans were losing. They could not hope to overcome the overwhelming amount of Allied men and material arriving, and their casualties could simply not be replaced. But to fully break the Germans, the Allies would have to turn it up a notch. The offensive was to be elevated to core level, 300,000 men, but they would practice a specific kind of warfare, Blitzkrieg. Maximizing their superiority in artillery and armor, they would create a Schwerpunkt at Casino and take the whole area in one massive swoop. The honor of capturing the monastery was to go to the newly arrived Polish army. Fighting for the British in the Second Polish Corps under Lieutenant General Vladislav Anders, the Poles were eager to settle scores with the Germans. The overall story of the Polish diaspora is certainly worth an episode of its own, as from April 1942 onwards, hundreds of thousands of Poles had crossed the Caspian Sea to the Persian coast through Iraq and Palestine to fight at Tobruk and Sicily. Now the Poles relieved the Moroccans and prepared to storm the German positions. On May 11th, after 1,600 guns had unleashed hell on the German positions, the infantry advanced. The casualties were heavy, running into German mortar and Nebelwerfer rounds, and the fighting continued all day. But the surviving and shell-shocked defenders were finally pushed from their positions. As night fell, the Germans gave the order to retreat from the monastery, and as the sun rose on the 12th, the Poles stormed the slopes and flew the Polish flag high above Monastery Hill, signaling the battle's end. The fight for Italy was not over, not by a long shot, but for the moment, the Allies could bask in their hard-won victory. The sorrows of the Abbey, however, were not over, and indeed, much of it vanished as souvenirs of Allied soldiers. The whole area was a graveyard for thousands of men from many different nations, and that Abbey, the first house of the Benedictine Order of Monks, established by St. Benedict himself over 1,500 years before, was a ruin on poisoned ground. It would be rebuilt after the war, but the dead, the dead remain. Union is actually one of my kind of secret favorite songs. Okay. Uh, See, I wouldn't have guessed that, right? No, that. that's the thing though, it's like, when we made it, it's on Art of War, and it never really translated the way I wanted it to sound on the album. If it was the production, uh, our playing or performing it, I don't know actually. Yeah. And uh, over the years, we barely played it live in the beginning, and then later on through the years, we started to pick it up again, okay. and uh, a bit rearranging it, and it finally, came to life. I think we brought it on tour in, uh, on the Last Stand tour in 2016-17. Wow. It's uh, actually one of my favorite uh, songs to play live. Well, what, what is, it, is it a fan favorite now? Or is this the band plays it because the band likes to play it? <laughs> <laughs> a bit of both. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I still think it's a bit of an underrated song, uh, but it, it usually brings a smile to people's faces when we play it, you know? We'll see. Hopefully it'll be back someday. I want to play it again. Now, it's interesting subject matter because, of course, the fighting in Italy you've covered in other songs, like in Smoking Snakes. Yes. Smoking, smoking Snakes. Smoking Snakes. Um, yes. Now, there, it was, you know, the sitting around and they got the name Smoking Snakes. And here it's a bear. Yes, Wojtek. <laughs> I think that's quite interesting, too. I didn't, I didn't know about that until we started, you know, working with the song about the yeah. story of the bear. I mean, only the amount of nationalities involved in this. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. Uh, a kind of fascinating battle. And I think also a sort of iconic setting. Battle, yeah, know? and you know, a, a lot of people, uh, particularly in the West, particularly like America and Britain, places like that, you lose sight of the Italian campaign compared to D-Day and the campaign in Western Europe, or for the Americans, the campaign in the Pacific and stuff. It's relegated to third, fourth, fifth, sixth place. People tend to see more about the North Africa 
mm -hmm. than the Italian campaign. But of course, it was a, a hugely important campaign. Absolutely. War. I mean, it goes for most conflicts, I would say. Yeah. I mean, there's always a sort of a pecking order who, who, which country had the most powerful entertainment industry at the time? Ah, yeah, the... <laughs> that's, uh, well, that's those are thing. the stories that get told, you know. Yeah, and also the language barrier. I mean, it's pretty easy for. Uh, I'm not bashing America or, or the UK in any way here, but I mean, having an internationally easily accessible language, and when you're making movies, will those stories will get told much more, and especially for me in Eastern Europe. I mean, coming. Uh, with the Soviet Union rolling in and pretty much yeah. slamming the door shut and sometimes, you know, not encouraging that a country's history to be spread makes it much harder to find those stories. That's true. And that's a real shame. One thing, though, uh, which uh, side note and, and a plug, at some point, probably in a year or year and a half, we're going to start doing on, the, on my World War II channel. We're going to start doing stuff about the home front where we cover like the music and films of the different nations. Like one episode could be about Japanese film and Japanese music in the early 40s, or Chinese, or oh. Soviet Union. I thought that would be a really interesting like. Can I be a guest? Series. Absolutely. I think it's going to be like different ones for. It's going to be a regular series. Oh, cool. So, because there's a lot of countries to cover. I have no idea, for example, what the popular Italian music of 1943 was like, but I'm looking forward to learning about that. Or the Hungarian, or the Romanian, you know? It would be amazing to hear. So that's why I think, so this is a shameless plug for something we're not even going to do for at least another year because we have plenty of other stuff that we got to do. Oh, yes. Us. Lots of stuff to do. Okay. Well, uh, that was Union then. All yes. Right. I guess so. All right. Thanks for today. See you next time. Take care. All right, everyone. That's it for this week. And you know what? This show has been a lot of fun to produce and we want to keep doing it. And we can do it through your help, through Patreon, but you can also help us by, well, subscribing, turning on notifications, and, yeah, telling your friends. So, click there for more videos, and remember to check out Indy's other channels. Thank you very much, and see you soon.